Good morning. I would like to welcome you to the Eastern European session. Uh, we have a special uh, construction of this session, which will consist of, of the two uh, uh, presentations. And after that, we will just start the discussion panel. The discussion panel will be uh, uh, started with the short updates of the uh, Eastern Europe networking countries uh, uh, as uh, uh, Estonia, uh, Moldova, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, will be the open discussion, and uh, here we welcome all of you to the active participation in this. Yes, please hear, uh, hear the first speaker, Mr. Michał Przybylski from PSNC. Will be presented the Porta Optica project. Raz, raz, raz. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michał Przybylski. I'm going to present shortly the uh, few information about the Porta Optica project, about uh, our plants or plants of Poland and in this area in connecting Eastern European networks to Jeanne and ex extending the connectivity status in this area of the world. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the infrastructure of Pioneer Network, which is considered the base for this uh, activity. One of the bases, because there are several other networks in the region, which are also present here, which can participate in this project. Uh, I'll speak a little bit about cross-border dark fiber connections, uh, which are possible to be built in this area. I'm going to also speak about the Porta Optica initiative at all, and then a little bit about the Port Optica study proposal, which has been submitted to the last IST call. Um, first of all, we all know that there is digital divide in Europe. Depending on the project, on the activity, on the area, the digital divide can be different. This is, for example, EGE project coverage. And you can see which countries participate in that project, which countries will develop better grid infrastructures, which will not, the countries which will not are, are, are the white, white ones, the color ones are the partners. If you look at the, another map of Europe, which uh, uh, can show, for example, digital divide, looking at the 10 gigabit per second connectivity. This blue line shows all the countries that have 10 gigabit per second. All the countries do not have that co connectivity. That's already discrimination. If you look two and a half gig, that line on the east didn't move. Are the same countries. If we go on 622, it didn't move at all. So all these countries east of this line, they, they, are not, they are not connected at a high speed. So there have to be action, actions taken to change the situation. And these actions are possible. So right now, after these two slides, I, I think I have the right to say that there is digital divide in Europe, at least in the research networking and the grid infrastructures. Uh, our network is located somewhere on the border of this divide. We are so happy to build our network uh, pretty quickly and with pretty extensive infrastructure. And we are somewhere in the center, and we can use that opportunity to also share our infrastructure with other countries of the region to improve their connectivity, to improve their status, their internet. What is that infrastructure? That infrastructure is completely on fiber. Fiber owned, built ourselves in cooperation with telecom, uh, telecom operators. Fiber that covers at the, say at the end of this year, mid of the next year, that covers 22 metropolitan, 22 major cities, which are also cities where metropolitan area networks are, are present. Um, right now, what you can see in the red color, there are installed lines, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I go later to the details how much fiber is there. But just right now, the red lines are connected with the high speed. Also, this, this situation changes dy dynamically, so I think that post 9 Warsaw is already working as well. Uh, so these red lines are finished, and the blue lines are right now under construction, and these green dashed lines are planned, planned or contracted. So we hope by 2006, this whole 
infrastructure will be here in place. As you can see, this is not only Poland, this is also Polish border, like here, like here in Guben, and also on the, on, the, on, the, on the east of Poland and on the north. What is in that infrastructure? Because fiber can, can mean different things in different countries. Well, before 2004, we were building fiber in cooperation with telco operators, where we were sharing one cable. In this one cable, we, had, we have actually uh, 12 single mode fibers, which is G652, and four non zero dispersion shifted fibers, with a total amount of 2,763 kilometers. Well, everything that we built after 2004, so what we're building right now, is not just uh, part of the cable. Right now, we, we have separate tubes, separate cable, and also empty tubes, pipes, where you can put a new fiber. So this is also opportunity. We built infrastructure which is future-proof. If something changes, the new technology, new fiber types, we can put just new fiber into new pipe, and, and we have uh, a way to expand in the future. So uh, right now, in these new links, we have uh, 24 uh, fibers, six of them G655, especially uh, uh, designed for high-speed transmission, and the rest is, is single-mode fibers. Well, a commercial slide, I would say, or advertisement. Some networks tend to calculate a fiber pair product. Uh, we have 22,000 kilometers of fiber pairs available. Of course, it doesn't translate directly to what we have because they're usually in the same cable. But anyway, that's how much infrastructure is there. That's how much infrastructure has to be maintained. And that's how much infrastructure can be used for research community. So it is not only one fiber when you can share logical channels, but this is the cable when you can share fibers. And fibers can create completely different infrastructures depending on what we want to do. And except for the other numbers here, 22 metropolitan area networks are, are connected. And they're all connected, or not all, but this, uh, which are now connected, they're connected with 10 gigabit Ethernet, and they all will be connected with 10 gigabit Ethernet over DWDM. This DWDM system, yet simplified, can support up to 32 lambdas, which uh, means it is also future-proof, at least for the nearest few years. Later on, we can use next fibers. Uh, this is the transmission infrastructure. I differ from, from, fib uh, from fibers here. This is just a uh, red color with the 10 gigabit Ethernet links that are available right now. Um, you can see some metropolitan area networks where the fibers were, were, were not finished yet are connected with 1 gigabit per second. But uh, by 2006, they all be 10 gigabit per second, including also international connections. In the fourth quarter of 2005, so by December, we're going to upgrade the uh, parts of the network to two lambdas, which is in this uh, blue color. So we'll have two lambdas on the major directions in the country, which will also help to, uh, to provide international connectivity. Well, so much for the infrastructure in Poland. Uh, why we propose Porta Optica? We propose Porta Optica because we have cross, or we have, or we will have cross-border dark fiber. This is a completely new concept in, in giant community, in, in research networking community, which, which aims at using fiber Transborder fiber to provide connectivity between two networks. Not only, I'm mean like not having in parallel giant fibers or Dante fibers or whoever else fibers that you have to pay twice, but having just the same fibers that your NRN is using for connectivity between the NRNs. There are still some issues with this. Just to say, cross border dark fiber has been defined so far as a dark fiber provided by two networks and used as a basic building block for link provision between two or more networks. This concept needs some more elaboration. There's ongoing work in Giant uh, 2 community right now. The extensions of this model is that probably Giant fibers can, can also support NREN development. So if Giant, fiber, if Giant procures fiber, then NRENs can use it to connect more universities, more cities. And the message here is that cross-border fiber is, uh, is a new light in the tunnel. <laughs> It's a disruptive technology that will probably change Jant in very few years. Well, we are prepared for that. Uh, we have planned, we have built, and we are building uh, cross-border fiber connections to our neighbors. So uh, we'll have this connection to, uh, we have already uh, one connection to Germany. 
We have already one connection to Czech Republic. Uh, and planned connections are to Russia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and Slovakia. And we hope we'll be very soon on the border with these fibers, although I know already that some of our neighbors will be faster than us. So it seems that our ideas are getting momentum, and probably very soon we'll connect to Ukrainians as well and, and maybe others. So this is a good message. Something's happening in this part of, the Europe, of Europe. Well, these are the networks that are currently connected. So in this part of Europe, you can see Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia who have their own fibers. They are all connected right now with, uh, say, just enough speed. It's one gigabit per second, which would be uh, probably very shortly upgraded to 10 gigabit per second, which will be uh, completely end-to-end -end owned infrastructure, cross-border infrastructure when access to the resource of NRS is granted on own, on own fibers. Well, this infrastructure on the last slide is extending a little bit this circle that I shown on, the, on one of the first slides, showing only Poland. Now you can see also Czech Republic, Slovakia, probably also other countries in the area are building something which can be used for later purpose. Well, Porta Optica Initiative, which was announced in, in TNC 2003 in Zagreb, is about building distributed optical gateway from Jean to Eastern Europe. As you, can, you could see this uh, digital divide uh, lines that I, I tried to, to, to project on the map of Europe. Everything finishes somewhere on the eastern border of Poland. Uh, oh, behind that line, there, is, uh, there are good people, but there is not enough money, not, a, not enough influence, and, and not enough infrastructure. And this country seems to be uh, a little bit forgotten by, by the rest of the European community, yet they're still in Europe. So we have the chance to, to, to have closer collaboration with these people, to have better infrastructures on the borders, and to, to extend Giant in an easy, cost-effective way to these countries, thus improving the Giant coverage and the Giant significance in this world. Well, Port Optica can be a coordinated task. And in fact, some of this coordination that uh, uh, is shown here, at, or at least the coordination centers, are present in Porta Optica study proposal. Uh, there's no net infrastructure on the north, which can be used for connections from the north. There is uh, Central Europe infrastructure, which is Czechs, Polish, and Slovaks, which can be used also for connecting neighbors. And also Greeks are very active, and they have separate project, which is called Seafire, which aims at connecting these Balkan countries to the fiber. So these all initiatives are somewhere close together. I'm not sure what's happening in Odinet with regards to, to the countries. I know, I know Russia has already connection. I know, I know uh, they have good partnership with Russians, so, so they are good partners for us as well. And, and this, way, this way, if the fiber is there, and I'm sure the fiber is there, if it's not there, it has to be built. <laughs> if the fiber is there and can be built, then we can close loops, we can, we can prepare fiber rings and install some equipment so these countries are better connected and they benefit from the European research better. Well, right now, just to sum up, the results are such that we are prepared for connection of Eastern Europe countries, or at least we'll be very ready in the next year. Uh, we already connected Belarus. We don't have fiber yet, but we have a uh, telco channel to Belarus, and we just share some of our bandwidth with, with, with this uh, Bastnet network. Uh, Ukraine is building dark, dark fiber to the border. We know we have some intensive talks with Kaliningrad people. They also want to connect. Well, uh, some initial cross-border fiber ideas are verified in this uh, environment of three networks in Europe. And this proposal for Porta Optica has been submitted to the uh, uh, research infrastructures call of European Commission, and it has uh, good marks. So I, I think this is an evaluation study aiming at at investigation of possibilities of building dark fiber in the area, right? And the area is all the Eastern Europe countries, also Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Moldova, and countries, uh, also Russia a little bit. So what is required? Well, we, we need to work on cross-border dark fiber connectivity. And this has been also uh, confirmed by yesterday meetings here within Jean. Well, workshops are necessary. Uh, to, to, to teach people like customer empowered fiber uh, workshops like the one held in Prague are very necessary because people learn how to use fiber. They learn what are the devices that can be used and they get better experience from people who already did it. Well, we know NATO and Seafire. Uh, uh, NATO uh, 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 runs several projects in the area. 
CFI is just one, one of the projects run by, run by Greeks. Uh, well, we, we can see some troubles with fiber infrastructure in, 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 uh, in Caucasus area, but this area is also very much in interest of, of European Commission. And I think that even if we are so far from Caucasus, we still can play a role over there. Not we as Poland, but we as Europe. Uh, because Caucasus is on, on the border of Europe. And we are meeting here. <laughs> we are meeting here at this session, and we'll be here around for, for much longer. We have the panel here, so uh, there will be a chance to speak, to talk. And that will conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will ask, answer them. But eventually, if there are questions at the end. I would like to shift our questions to the, uh, our panel. Now we have thank you for the presentation. Thank you. of the Senate organization in replacement of the uh, Professor Oliver Pop of President of the Senate will be present the uh, uh, structure function of this organization which is very active in this reg region. Yes, please. I'm presenting this presentation on behalf of Professor Oliver Popov, the chairman of the CNET, who regrettably could not come here due to the very important meeting he has today in somewhere in Sweden, and he had to go. But I have worked with him for so much time that I think I can somehow cope with the task, which is always not easy. So uh, as you have seen, there is a clear digital divide, and what Michal shown, the world changes. So there are completely different situations on the western part and the eastern part. And that was one of the incentives why we have created a few years ago a CNET, an association which groups the entrants of the central and eastern Europe, which historically have a little bit uh, have a little bit different setting, but these settings are very similar within the region, and uh, so there is always was something like a traditional respect for academia in this region. On th but our main problem was always the lack of awareness among the decision makers. This region and the scene has started when Poland, Hungary, and let's say Romania were the part of this, of this, were in exactly the same situation, had some social and economic difficulties, you know it very well, and they are subject to an extensive uh, external aid. And this aid has to be somehow coordinated, it has to be learned how to make the best use of it, and that's our mission. There is also not so much human capacity in the region on which you can base the creation of the network, and that's why our main goal was always the educational activities to create the needed human base, human capacity, um, which can cope with the problem of the development of the entrance in the region. We have a severe problems with the telecom monopolies and a very high tariffs. You've been through all this, so you know it very well. And the situation and the solution, which is now su suggested by, by the Porta Optica perspective, is exactly the way around. But let's say we have a countries like Armenia where you cannot move at all. And even if you change setting in your router, you nearly have to get an allowance for it. Yeah? And there is a lot of fragmentation of the errors. We have a situation in several countries where we have rivaling networks, academic networks. We have rivaling ministries, rivaling, uh, I don't know, commercial, which is maybe useful, 
Uh, and that's all have to be somehow helped and coordinated, and we are trying to move this um, experience to the east. So how it started? Somewhere in 92, let's say there were four countries, which are now a uh, member of the giant and fully connected. At that time, with the help of Aconet and NSF and RIPE and Deutsche Forschungsnet, there was a kind of a memorandum of understanding signed to, to create to cooperate. Yeah? Later on, there was a working group to establish a kind of an association, and there was a letter of intent. And somewhere in 1994, there was a first general assembly. We adopted our statute. And all this will never happen with the very leading role of Aconet, our Austrian colleagues, who were always for us a kind of a, a source of information, source of know how and also source of funding to some extent in this very, very initial part. And our gratefulness to Aconet is unlimited because be without them, this region will never start up. At the moment, we have uh, 26 member organizations. These are NRANs from the Central and Eastern Europe, from the South and Eastern Europe, from nearly all countries of the former Soviet Union. This includes also Central Asia, so countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and so on, and to the south, even to Turkey. We cooperate even with such a uh, farther countries like Afghanistan, which starts to be interested in our activities. The organization is quite similar. We have one representing organization per country and one vote per country. This is independent on the size of the country. So this gives some kind of a, those who are less developed feel very comfortable in this, in this uh, uh, community, especially that we feel that we keep our fees very, very small. The, 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 those very poor countries are paying I mean, according to your newest scheme, or something like 400 euros per, per year. So they can afford it. Otherwise, they will be out of the picture. And in that case, we can have a contact with them. We have two offices in Vienna, which is more formal, and the more active is in, 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 in more daily work is done in Warsaw, where also the secretariat is committed, is, uh, has its seat. And as usual in every association, there is a general assembly, which is which is the highest body and the management committee who does uh, real management of the, of, the, um, of the association. Our activities are two types. There are educational and scientific workshops, so educational activities, as, because, as we said, we think that building this capacity, this human capacity, is, is really, at this moment, the highest priority. And we run several projects. So. Workshops are of different types, either technology or management of policy. Projects are, let's say, these are network infrastructure grants. This was profileration of the Cisco academies. There are some e-learning, some IST projects, some since now also CEDA, the Swedish agency, is very active in this region and is working with us. So what, are, what is the goals and objectives of this workshop? It's a dissemination of technical know-how and especially how to build the essential infrastructure. And I think that laying and building the, and using the dark fiber could be and should be a topic of one of the nearest workshops we, we are planning. And the management strategies and policy issues are topic of this, of this uh, management workshops. And here the main, the main uh, I would say, stress is on stability and sustainability, which is just cannot be achieved without uh, also good technical um, competence. So how it started, there was, all you know, there were famous ISOC workshops somewhere in mid-90s, and we are probably 80% of those people who are here are somehow, somewhere were at one of, or more of them. And the idea was, which was developed with, with Ben Surf, was to, to have something regional of the same type. And that's how we started. The funding comes from NATO, mainly. And they, they have this so-called very easy to use mechanism called advanced networking workshop mechanism. But also from OSI, so it means the Soros Foundation, 
who had a first the project to develop the internet in the region and then the, and then the information flow and, and things like this. Yeah. So what we do, we have a quite a stable and team of lecturers, something like 30, 40 lecturers. And they come either from our countries, they are sometimes alumni of our workshops, or from more developed Western Europe, German, US, uh, Nordic countries. And this team is year by year, depending on the topic, of course, it changes uh, doing these workshops. We are always trying to get some exposure and some contact with the, with the industry, so these people know that it is not a closed world, but it's also something which they, they should interact with Cisco, they interact with Juniper, with several companies have been presenting and the equipment to our workshop so they, during the technical workshop, they can have a hands-on exercises on a, let's say, up-to-date equipment. Um, also, what is always important to talk is what are the social implications of the technology, and that was always very, very strongly stressed by our workshops. Usually our motto is that we connect machines to connect the people. Let's say now, very quickly, I will just go through the format and technology. So we have some theory, and we have a lot of exercises usually at these workshops. We bring these companies and give them so-called like, like a sponsor spotlight where they can present their products. And these evening lecture sectors, lectures are for this more, let's say, social-oriented stuff. We had already 10 of them. This year, we have a jubileum, the 10th one in Ohrid. Initially, there were two tracks. One was more routing. The other was maybe information systems. Then we introduced the, the distance education as a quite important topic. And then we had a series of very narrow-oriented uh, workshops, like, say, when Silk was introducing their, their VSAT technology for this region. We had a VSAT or wireless workshops. Um, we had also kind of a, what is, in, for instance, uh, worth mentioning here, some of the workshops were taught in Russian to, to get, uh, let's say, since they were devoted to this region, to get a better, let's say, understanding. And the example of it was a, was a um, workshop we organized in Tver together with Ms. Mrs. Gajane Walczewska from Belarus. And there were, okay, four workshops on management, five workshops on, on policy. Some of them were co-organized with the Turena, and we are very grateful for it because they gave us really the input how to do it. We learned a lot, and we are be more than happy to continue this. So in the case of management and policy workshops, uh, our main issues are about, of course, target groups and domain services. We talk a lot about how to deal with the telecoms, what are the funding medals, and the stresses on growth and stability. There were some things more complicated, like say we have done in, in July 2000, so called the flying workshop, where we took NREN representatives of those countries who didn't have a network, uh, NREN in there, so let's say NRENs in Statu Nastendi, and we showed them how it looks in Prague, in, in Chestnut, in, in, in NASK, in Poland, and in INET. And uh, Samir was, I think, one of the members of this team who was flying around the Europe. And um, for them, we have created, let's say, uh, Maria was one of the organizers of, the, of this uh, locally. To help them, we created the so-called NREN creation cookbook, which was translated to Russian so that they uh, could more easily prepare themselves and, and, and discuss it within their own, uh, their own um, organizations. A kind of a thing which had really impact was the creation of Cisco Academies. There is now, nowadays, when we started, there was no single Cisco Academy in the region. Now there are more than 1,000, I think, in the, in the whole region. So it's around 1,000 already. And apart from the workshops, we do projects. This is now gaining the, the, the importance. Let's say we more or less 
think that we have created this needed human potential, so the, the workshop ac activity will not be the most important in the very moment. There will be more smaller and topical workshops, not this same type. But so we are in a kind of a, uh, let's say, uh, we usually, our role is somehow a, of, of an organization who has good links, who does the liaison, who, who, who does the dissemination, who recruits the people for different projects which cover the other regions. So that was the one which we did, Alari, with Italian groups, Eduline with the whole uh, Nordic consortium. The ICT for ICT is a modeling ICT diffusion. It has a pilot project in Armenia. So step by step, we go into the direction of having the, uh, having the <coughs> As I already said, our main uh, partners were always NATO, former um, scientific affairs division, now is public diplomacy, uh, but also the OSI. But we worked also with Internet Society. We have several projects with Internet Society. And in many cases, Cisco was providing us with the books and, 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 uh, and the... And the um, and the equipment. But also many others, let's say, O'Reilly was providing books, Juniper was providing fantastic, uh, let's say, infrastructure to our workshops, many, many others, I will, you see them here. So what is at the very end? What is uh, the present situation? We have uh, something like good stable team of the lecturers, we have course designers for uh, different courses, we have something like 11 years experience in doing this uh, in logistics and management of, of training events and, let's say, liaison to this. Quite a specialty is the, is the distance education, which we always stressed as something able to allow us to reach to this very wide and dispersed region. And we have steady cooperation with something like 30 entrants and something we maintain lively contacts with our alumni, which is a thousand, something like thousand people we have, and they are all in our database, and they are they are the pillars of the networking in their countries. Okay, the same error. Yeah. So what is the future? The pi the picture is different. Half of our members are now <laughs> members of the EU, even more the members of NATO. And uh, so there is a quite an overlap. Some, they already moved to, let's say, the, the left side of the digital divide. Yeah? And on the right side, we still have uh, something like uh, 20 our members. And that's what we are, uh, uh, let's say, focusing on. With the great help of these 10 members which are on the other side, they are really seeing it as a kind of a challenge. They want really to cooperate with these less developed ones. They have a lot of this experience because they went through the same process. So they know and understand what, what the problems could be. Uh, but OK, uh, some of our members are really underdeveloped. Uh, if you take the uh, network in Turkmenistan or Tajikistan, it's nearly not existing. Yeah? And, but OK, we are also not existing 10 years ago. so. So, and clearly we will have now more EU-related projects. We are part of this Porta Optica study and hope to contribute to it su substantially. And, okay, our focus is also for a closer cooperation with Asia-Pacific region and, 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 and uh, because, uh, okay, there are some talks with China and, 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 and even like that, yeah. China has interest in these neighboring countries, of course. <laughs> So thank you so much for your attention. I thank the organizers for allocating this session. I would like to thank to Juniper for funding the arrival of people from this region. OK, Oliver wants to thank me that I talk, had his talk. OK, that's my duty. That's it. The discussion will come later, yeah? Yes. 
I would like to invite the five representatives of the Eastern Europe networking countries. The first will be the Mr. Samir Aliver Dibayov from Azerbaijan. After that will be Ms. Gajana Walczewskaya from uh, Belarus. Next is Petru Bogatencov from Moldova, Maria Rikstov from Estonia, and the presentation will be finished by Vladimir Galagan from Ukraine. I will help Samir. I will help Samir with translation to English. He will speak in Russian, but uh, the presentation will be in English. Yeah, okay, these slides are in English. Before they start, let me let me let me give you the overview of the situation at the, in the Caucasus. Uh, there are three countries: Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. As you know, there are some tensions between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And the new devil. Uh, so Georgia seems like okay. You are already you are ready. Okay, then I stop my comments. <laughs> Okay, the, the new development is that they have built a oil pipe to Turkey and along with this oil pipe there is a lot of fiber and it has to be investigated and it will be investigated in Porta Optica, the usage of it, because the way to this region may lead either through, uh, through uh, Ukraine or through Turkey. So the, his organization, ASNET, was created in Azerbaijan five years ago. Uh, after two years, it was clear that there is no enough money and funding to develop the NREN. So after some initial talks and realizing this fact, in 2004 they started the ASNET project. And which is now being done in a cooperation of these four partners. You can see two types of interactions between the partners. So the funding comes from four different sources, the government of, uh, okay, you see it, government, UNDP, Soros Foundation, and the Azorena, which is an association, just my remark, is an association of users of academic networks of Azerbaijan. So the, 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 let's say, Soros, Azarena, and United Development con contribute with, uh, and UNDP contribute with money, whereas the government of uh, Azerbaijan contributes by giving the, availability and the usage of the fiber available to them. So the main goal of the uh, of the ASNET project is to find out what is needed for the development of uh, NREN and computer academic networking in the country. Okay, how how to develop the fundraising and and some kind of a sustainability. For a Let's say decent development of NREN in the country, 
something like 400,000 euros per year are needed. Dollars or euros, I don't know. It's yeah. dollars, dollars. Uh, this does not include the in-kind contribution of the government of uh, Azerbaijan in form of the fiber. And it doesn't include the investment in, in the equipment which is done by the orga uh, contributing organizations themselves. The project as it is now is fully devoted to develop the internal uh, infrastructure of the country, so not the external links. This is the list of the typical, uh, let's say, user groups. And the picture shows the typical topology. In Azerbaijan, you have four major cities. In all these four major cities, there is already, a, let's say, local uh, fiber, sometimes fully laid, sometimes only partially. Okay, so they are all, they all are or should be the in, in with the ring structure going from one uh, telephone station to another telephone station and with the ADSL and DHCL technology to the, the final uh, the, let's say end users are being uh, connected Okay, mm, they are trying to get an, uh, several other international organizations with the similar, let's say, goals to be a part of the project. Okay. Okay, the external connectivity, which is the mainly the via satellite, is something like 3.5 megabit per second only. So it's very, very, very little, <laughs> I would say. Now the project as it, as it is now was rather devoted to the internal structure. Let's say the external uh, international connectivity was not the major goal of this project. So there are two networks in the country at the very moment. One is Aznet created, which he is running, and the other is Azrena, which has which uh, which has a. Let me now explain it. It has a double role. It has its own network, but it's also an association of other sub-networks, the major part being ASNET. So ASNET can be regarded as a self-standing network, but also as a part of the association of networks, of academic networks. No, who will, and they jointly now develop this structure, so there is quite a, being a consultant for <laughs> Skokasus, I know that is one of the very good examples of the internal uh, coordinations. Now he will talk what, what fiber is already existing in, in Azerbaijan. Okay, they are put in these countries where, uh, which are marked green, which means not in the mountains, but uh, on the lower part of the Azerbaijan. Okay, there are three major, uh, major, um, major um, lines. One is from north to Baku, so from Russia to Baku. Uh, then the other one is to the southern direction to the border with Iran. 
and the, uh, from Baku to the west to the border with Georgia. There are smaller pieces going to several regional towns, but not to the border. Okay, that's it. That's how the situation looks like. Uh, so there is quite a good chance to let me comment to get to the Georgia, because there, because of the pipe and because of the already existing two lines there. And uh, that's how they, and the other, which is working, is to the Russia. And in fact, the other network is using the Russian uh, fiber as a kind of a backup solution. So let's say only, they take only downlink satellite, and but uplink goes, let's say, via fiber, via Russia. That's how the situation is in Caucasus, more or less, and in Azerbaijan. Thank you, Samir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Gajana Walczewska. I am Deputy Director General for the National Center for Informational Resources and uh, Technologies, which was created uh, due to the decree of the President of the Republic of Belarus. Being uh, pioneers in creation and internet in our country, now we are operating Belarusian and RIAN. Uh, what is the present situation with um, our NREN that is called BASNET and is affiliated with the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus? Uh, let me uh, stress that there are only two internet and service providers in our country, Bell Telecom and our organization. And uh, for years, we are the main competitors to our telecom. If uh, telecom is operating now 250 bandwidths that uh, they are selling to other internet service providers, we, since uh, the year of 2004, have a direct link to Giant with a capacity of uh, 34 megabits. And um, that uh, this was possible due to uh, the help of our Polish colleagues, due to Poznan Supercomputer and Networking Center, and uh, due to goodwill of giant management. We are very grateful for this uh, assistance and support. A part of um, the link of 32 megabit to giant, we also have uh, a link of uh, 2 megabit. This is a radio li uh, link for the Russian fund of um, uh, informational scientific, uh, scientific research. And um, for so-called commercial users, commercial uh, customers, we are renting a fiber capacity of 1 megabit from Bell Telecom. We own us 40 kilometers of um, fiber and we are the main uh, customer in the country for Bell Telecom. And um, clearly, we have uh, antagonistic interests. Who are our customers? Among our customers are main uh, Belarusian ministries, such as State Committee for Science and Technology, 
Ministry of uh, Trade, Ministry of Economy, Ministry for Military, uh, Industry and Development. Uh, there are more than more than uh, 100 uh, scientific institutions and universities which are linked to our network directly. We uh, also linked five uh, large-scale cooperative networks and um, we have more than 30,000 of users. Uh, BusNet constructed 40, 14 made, uh, main uh, networking nodes uh, and uh, these nodes are connected by fiber optic channels with a capacity up to 10 gigabit uh, per second. A part of this, uh, we have six regional centers covering all uh, Belarusian regions. And um, mm, some, uh, some of our organizations are connected using uh, radio Ethernet technology with a speed from uh, 2 up to 11 uh, megabits. Why uh, customers are satisfied uh, with us and um, what, uh, uh, what services that we are provi uh, providing for free to our customers? Among such services, um, access to uh, software repository, access to electronic scientific publications, access to cooperative electronic um, librarian catalog, and um, once more access to digital full text uh, articles. Uh, we are providing Belarusian scientists with access to uh, publications from more than 40,000 scientific journals and among uh, such journals are so respective journals as uh, Kluver Progress, American Physics uh, Journal, um, Elsevier. Let me, um, let me uh, tell that all this uh, will never be possible without uh, the leader, the father of our net network, Professor Mahanyok, who is uh, really the main strategic resource and the main motor and uh, energy for the network development. <coughs> and um, thanks to uh, his uh, energy, uh, now networking activities are um, cherished in the country and uh, we are able to get uh, funds from governmental budget and um, can you imagine through the fund that it is allocated for science we are supporting networking not only mm, at the National Academy of Sciences but also networking activities in other ministries for example Ministry of Education and um, of course currently funds uh, for networking cooperative networking development are uh, allocated also in um, other ministries who are operating their local networks. But uh, what worries us and um, what is require, uh, required and what is need help? We um, have access, free access to jams through, uh, through Polish academical network. However, price for transportation we are paying for our telecom is enormously high. Uh, each month, uh, one megabit costs us around $1,000. And uh, we pay for um, one kilometer more than uh, $40, $40. That is three times higher than um, the, the cost uh, in Poland in TPC, for example. And, um, I should say that uh, the policy of our telecom is uh, the main obstacle for networking developing and therefore for years we are getting such um, epithets as uh, less developed, uh, still countries who are for the another side of the digital divide and uh, here we need, uh, we, ne we really need help, uh, really need assistance uh, because uh, we have uh, rather qualified people 
uh, for example, um, uh, our um, director has a PhD uh, from Mannheim University, that is Garvard of Germany. We have um, people who are educated um, due to activities of uh, CNET, um, support of NATO Scientific Committee, and other uh, international universities. And um, we hope that um, our joint efforts in frames of Porta Optical Study Project will help us to um, to move uh, to move ahead and uh, to uh, join uh, de uh, developed developed countries and developed community. Uh, my, my my mission uh, is uh, to um, address to. Uh, maybe done to, to giant management um, with a, a request to uh, organize direct negotiations with our telecom and to push them to mm, decrease cost for transportation to get uh, Belarusian scientific and ed educational community uh, affordable price for access to uh, giant. Uh, this is the first and um, and pressing, and uh, the second, we very much hope to be able to construct uh, a cross-border link to um, connect directly both our networks, Polish Academy of Science network and uh, BASnet, uh, national national and ran of um, our country. Uh, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to mm, express my gratitude to organizers of the uh, conference, of the event, of um, uh, Giant and um, of um, our mm, uh, respective partners of the Polish uh, Poznan uh, Center of Supercomputing and Networking, who made possible our presence here. As, uh, about, uh, as about our perspective plans, we would like to be full uh, members of, uh, well, I forgot about my presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about my slides, but it is <laughs> not, very <laughs> not very long. Uh, here is uh, the uh, scheme, uh, how we are connected uh, to uh, Giant uh, through Poland. And um, we would like to be a full member of uh, Giant 2, and we would like to follow um, your uh, regulations. So uh, please support us, to, uh, support us to accept and to take uh, this um, challenge. I would like um, to, uh, to uh, say that it is my first time with uh, Tirena, and um, and I love uh, this time here in Poznan. So thank you very much for attention uh, and for your support. I'd like to invite Mr. Petro Bogatenzov. Present uh, Research and Educational Networking Association of Moldova, the National Research and Education Network in Moldova. Inam Association was founded in 1999, and uh, now it's a non-profit le legal entity which uh, serves uh, and uh, providing services <coughs> for research and educational community. Uh, we uh, deal with, uh, uh, first of all, Academy of Sciences of Moldova, with main state universities, 
as well as some private uh, scientific and uh, mainly uh, educational institutions are now connected to our networking infrastructure. Here is shown our main direction of activity. So RENAM now is working as a uh, provider of networking services, providing access to external uh, internet connections, using external internet connections. And uh, also we help our users in many cases to assist them to develop their own infrastructures, to develop their <coughs> own context, to help them to access to the information resources and uh, in make some consultation, making some consultation and many other <coughs> services in IT sphere. Uh, the association was founded, uh, first of all, due to decision of Academy of Sciences of Moldova. Uh, main universities such as uh, State University of Moldova, uh, Technical University of Moldova, Academy of Economical Studies. And in this, uh, there is <coughs> the first uh, agreement was uh, signed also by the Ministry of Education, uh, which is uh, helping us not directly, but in some methodical manner. Uh, so, if you overview the activity in the sphere of uh, scientific and educational networking segment development at Moldova, we can see two uh, different, maybe, uh, stages of this process development, before RENAM and after RENAM. So here are shown only uh, projects which are directly uh, de were devoted to uh, infrastructure development. There were some other projects which are uh, connected with uh, other activities, which, uh, of course, uh, have to be done by uh, our staff. Now, some words about external connections. Uh, of course, we have limitations, and we need to improve our external connections. This resource is very crucial for us, because uh, every year we try to expand uh, the capacity. But every year we uh, have requests from our universities and scientific institutions that they need more and more external capacity. So uh, uh, here you can see that now we operate radio relay link to Royodonet. This is our main external connection. Uh, through Royodonet backbone we reach giant uh, infrastructure. And uh, now radio relay link is overload. It's real situation. And this link can be uh, extended because uh, extended, I mean, uh, now we have 16 megabit per, per second. Uh, but uh, if we want to increase this capacity, we have to use other technology and for this reason, better in future to be uh, oriented on fiber technology because it's more perspective and more uh, easy for scalability. Uh, in RENAM network, there are two satellite ground stations which are ready to operate and used now only as a backup channels in any uh, situations. We uh, are present at uh, Mold Telecom Internet Exchange and all local traffic are uh, going through this uh, exchange point. And uh, with some providers, we have direct links for local traffic exchange. And in some ways, they are providing, and we are providing for them, and they for us backup uh, connectivity. And this year, we needed to coordinate our activity with uh, 
Internet service provider is a consortium which uh, ordered uh, more than 60 megabytes traffic from uh, our main uh, telecommunication operator, Mobile Telecom, and uh, Renam uh, permanently use uh, 5 megabits uh, capacity uh, now for from this consortium. And uh, in case when we need to order some additional resources, we have agreement to get from this consortium 10 megabit uh, per second balance. Uh, now I want to outline some directions of uh, our network development program. So we started and partly realized fiber optic infrastructure within Kishinev city municipal area network. And this uh, fiber optic segment operates on one gigabps uh, capacity. Uh, we have <coughs> uh, the projects to upgrade uh, mainly our links, uh, not only using fiber um, technology, but uh, in uh, some uh, far located campuses, uh, we utilize wireless connections point to point, and we installed some access points for Wi-Fi uh, access. Uh, <coughs> And uh, you see that we have contacts and collaborate with uh, service providers in Moldova. And uh, the very important uh, future plan of our activity is improve connections to the peripheral uh, centers in the on the territory of Moldova. Uh, some projects now are launched to introduce new technologies, and these projects we uh, want to execute with our colleagues from CE uh, REN region. Uh, <coughs> and what is very interesting that uh, we are now working uh, only with Romania and have connection with Romania, but uh, if we'll uh, <coughs> see the history uh, in uh, 1999, we started negotiation with Romania and Ukraine simultaneously to build uh, direct connections. But uh, from Ra Belarus, uh, from Ukrainian partners, we didn't uh, get any practical result. But Romanian uh, partners, they help us to provide uh, internet connection via giant. <coughs> So the, we have a plans to improve our connection to giant, and this one of the main uh, way in this direction is uh, participating in Porta Optica project. Yes. Uh, here is some projects which we are involved and we are, which we <coughs> implemented or are running now, and here is indicated Porta Optica project, which is very important for us in future. Uh, I will a little, uh, a few words about uh, our plans to extend external connections. You see, we can get uh, 34 megabits uh, via existing radio relay facility. We now started negotiation with Mall Telecom to get their uh, fiber optic connection, uh, but it's very important for us. We, we will. Uh, start in any case the work with other uh, providers, maybe commercial providers, but there is a, a special uh, center of special telecommunications which provides services for state enterprises, for ministries, departments, government itself. And maybe we all together build our own dark fiber on, to cover the distance uh, between Kishinev and Yash. So I uh, have to mention some words about uh, national wide backbone. Uh, this the problem is that now we can our own channel, radio relay channel between Kishinev and Belts, and uh, in other cities and other towns, we have again 
use uh, more telecom facilities, which is the prices of these facilities unreasonable in many cases. So our customers uh, can't pay for this to connect our infrastructure. Well, this is conclusions, and maybe I'll finish my presentation. Ms. Maria Ustkok, presented. Metro in Estonia. Okay. <laughs> Can you put it? So, um, let's see. So, I will talk about um, the, uh, the networking in Estonia. Um, first, I just show you the overview what I intend to talk. Um, my presentation is not um, very long. So, first I'll um, make a, just a general overview um, uh, about the academic networking in Estonia, then um, a little about currently used technologies. Um, also some development plans for coming years and as a success story um, I took um, an example for um, Ines user surveys. Uh, there is only one um, networking organization uh, especially for the needs of uh, uh, the organizations of education, uh, research and culture in Estonia. This is Estonian educational and research network, shortly EENET. Um, as we are 100% uh, financed by the government uh, through the Ministry of Education and Research, uh, then the uh, main services are free of charge. But also we have some charge uh, services. And besides um, our main um, uh, connectivity service, um, we also administer um, the uh, top level domain of the country code dot .ee. Thus, um, this is our um, another activity. Um, as I've not um, made a separate slide for cooperation, then I'd uh, probably mention here um, with which organizations we have the cooperation. Um, so, um, we are quite active uh, right now in Terena, um, uh, taking part in um, um, some task forces and, and um, initiative groups. Also, um, uh, we do cooperation with Dante as we take part in this giant project. And um, also CNET, as you already um, noticed from Jacek's uh, presentation. Um, so this is shortly um, the present uh, cooperation that we have uh, with the other organizations. Um, Actually, there is more, but I'll talk about it a little later. Um, all those um, organizations that um, do not use ENET services, I mean now uh, educational and research um, organizations, 
they uh, use the services of commercial uh, internet providers. And this is um, um, mostly then uh, small organizations and schools who are quite um, price sensitive and um, who just um, cannot um, consider um, a quality uh, more important than price. So, but there are also other reasons. Um, there are 920 customers um, uh, and um, there might be about uh, 1,500 academic institutions um, in Estonia. So as you see, um, there is about 30% um, of the target group then uh, who does not use um, e-net services. But as for our emphasis is not um, uh, other than the research uh, institutions and the uh, higher education like universities and colleges. So it's not our main priority. Um, now about uh, the currently used technologies. Um, I will, sh I will show here. Um, well, here is our backbone. It's a little furry picture, <laughs> but I hope it will do. Um, there is um, internal uh, backbone um, between two major cities, uh, capital Tallinn and Tartu, where Enet locates. And there we have um, uh, one gigabit um, dark fiber link operated by Enet itself. Um, and the other um, links uh, to the counties um, differ from um, two megabits to, to 10 megabits. But the universities um, are connected um, by one gigabit and 100 megabits. So it is a little bit different. Um, and there is uh, the external connection uh, to Stockholm and from Stockholm to Giant Network um, by uh, 622 megabits. So this is our, our backbone. Uh, which one? This one. Um, and we have um, some radio links as well on with it technology. As um, I was already talking about the um, currently used technologies, I would also make a short overview about our services. Um, there aren't all the services, just um, um, most um, part of what we offer. Uh, the permanent connectivity is, um, as you saw, a dark fiber between these uh, two major cities, Tallinn and Tartu. We have also some uh, copper still and uh, radio links. Uh, we lease the lines, we don't own them, uh, so we buy speed and, and bandwidth. Uh, as a um, second um, um, bigger service uh, we have is um, email boxes, which is quite popular, and mailing lists. And uh, one of the, um, the most popular service is actually web hosting. Uh, we also offer IP services on IPv4 and IPv6 uh, six and domain name servers. And uh, one of the most um, promoted service um, in the research community is right now the Estonian Greek project. And um, the leaders of the project um, have a quite good cooperation with our southern neighbors, Latvia and Lithuania, as well the northern neighbors, Nordonet. Um, and there are other services. Video transmission is um, a charged service hosting a server in Enet's rack, um, but the precise uh, time uh, service is free of charge. It's public and to be straight in one server. 
Uh, we have the plan to deploy the uh, dark fiber technologies um, to also the um, other towns in Estonia, um, which means then our own backbone. Um, and uh, this is financed by ENET, um, the government money that we um, get. Uh, the metropolitan uh, fiber networks uh, will be built uh, next year in two towns. And here, uh, Enet is only the initiator, not the uh, physical constructor of the network. And continuously, um, Estonian Grid project is um, promoted um, and uh, introduced um, in the research community. And we have um, uh, started it, as you see, uh, in 2003, so we have uh, experience in um, it already for two years. Um, so let's see. And finally, um, I just uh, talk um, shortly about our user surveys, uh, which I um, think is quite um, um, a success, success story. We have uh, practice with uh, making the user surveys um, already for five years. Now, um, probably you have um, noticed a poster downstairs who haven't, I just show a small version of it. Um, this is just uh, one of the um, most backwards, um, the, the, in the most end um, of the posters. Um, why do we um, do them? Because they are quite um, beneficial in many ways. Uh, for ourselves, as an NRN, NRN uh, we can evaluate our services, we can um, see the user profile, and um, it's not only that we get the information from the users, but we ourselves can give the information introducing our new services. Um, it's also um, beneficial for funding bodies that they can compare the data we have fixed. Um, with the other NRNs, and of course, it's good for justifying and, and raising budgets because you have some facts. Um, it's also useful for users themselves because um, they see that their opinion actually matters, that, that we really count their opinion. They, they can criticize, they can um, give us good new ideas, and we count them, and we can make and develop our network uh, as you see, um, we have high benefit from making the user surveys, and as we have um, a limited budget, um, as you all might have the same here in this room, then um, um, we don't uh, outsource it, but we do them ourselves, so it has low cost as well. There are some details on this poster, so if you have any questions, then just turn to me during the conference or by email afterwards. It's just um, an example what you can do with the data um, from the user surveys. Here is um, the satisfaction with the connectivity. So most of the, uh, of the organizations were satisfied. And those who weren't, you can see why they weren't and how big the percentage is. So too slow. Um, connectivity breaks, too expensive, or some other reasons. So everybody gets a feedback. Here are some links that I um, wrote down. One is about the Estonian Greed project. It's the English uh, link then. Uh, the other one is the user surveys on Enet's website, which is also the only version we have got so far in English. Um, and the third link is on Terena. Um, website under the um, task force of public relations and information dissemination. Uh, one of the deliverables there was um, how to make user surveys. So you might find some um, interesting information from there too. And here is my email address if you want to turn to me. So this is all right now. Dear participants, we have uh, three minutes to the standard to finish this session. I would like to propose to uh, 
uh, some time for the longer discussion and the last presentation from Ukraine. Yes, please, five minutes, keep this time. And uh, we have some special guests here, that is Mr. Wim Janssen from European Commission here, that I would like to uh, use this meeting here to the asking uh, him about the possibility to support Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe networking by the European Commission. You see here exactly what kind of problems we have here in this part of Europe. And I, will, I would like to propose that this discussion will be valuable for, for us all which are here. Uh, I see the many representatives of the Lithuania, Slovak Republic, <laughs> Russia, Kaningrad region, that in this case we can use this time for the discuss our problem here. get your lunch and, and you work and you can also organize that lunch will be waiting for you. So it's no hard. Uh, I am technical director of uh, URN, it is Ukraine Research Academic Network, uh, Vladimir Galagan. And, uh, my presentation very short about the situation in Ukraine with uh, research academic network and academic networking. URN uh, was started to develop uh, about 1997 with push from, uh, from uh, NATO by some projects. And support from NATO to prolong to this time and uh, uh, this year we get the obligation about new support from NATO for the networking. Uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, uh, that situation uh, in Ukraine uh, not, uh, not so good because, uh, for example, we apply the uh, line speed between univers universities not more than one megabit. It is uh, very small uh, especially for research uh, and uh, we cannot to apply this line to some research activity because uh, his line all overload by uh, common internet traffic. But uh, due to uh, the NATO support uh, we uh, lie some uh, optical line in the uh, cities, uh, is a big cities of uh, Ukraine. It is uh, uh, capital Kiev, uh, Kharkiv, uh, Odessa, and some another. Uh, it is amount about uh, 30, 30 kilometers. It is very small uh, quantity of uh, the clients, but we have some experience, uh, have some experience uh, just in uh, this technology for the line and the uh, customer and pilot uh, network. Uh, many, many problems we have in the organization structure uh, in Ukraine because we have some part of the uh, research education networking uh, 
some ISP providers which uh, give uh, the service to the research organization, to universities, and to the other uh, users uh, simultaneously. And uh, just we try to collect this uh, community uh, on the umbrella of uh, uh, network operation center, uh, call it. Uh, in this year, we get some joint order from uh, our uh, National Academy of Science and Ministry of Education, which uh, to implement this structure in the frame of uh, National Technical University of Ukraine. And we hope uh, to, in the future, to get uh, the budget money to support, uh, for support uh, our network, and to get grants without tax. Uh, about uh, budgeting, uh, about uh, financing our network. Oh, it is our structure uh, just uh, between uh, five providers, uh, research education networking in Ukraine, uh, different colors you can see. It is new structure of uh, no run in the in Kiev you can see uh, uh, you know it is a connection over fiber in this year we installed this structure some progress due to NATO NATO project NATO financing you can see some number of this network infrastructure grants. Uh, but uh, the support from state very small uh, in all this time from 1997 we get uh, about $100,000 only from the state. All structure uh, supported by the payment from users. We pay big part of money to the external channels. Uh, big part of money to the, our uh, own <laughs> Uk Telecom for the uh, cities line, for the uh, intercity lines. It is uh, very big for us, uh, us, us, dimension of funding. But uh, as you know, in these years, uh, have changed our president, our our uh, ministry, cabinet ministry, and we just try to uh, overcome this uh, bad situation in Ukraine with networking and with science and uh, education, and uh, to admit some project. Uh, this project, uh, or sorry, it is a plan of new NATO grants due to some uh, changing in Ukraine uh, and uh, success uh, previous uh, project with, uh, by NATO, we get new obligation from NATO for about $300,000 for uh, establishing uh, infrastructure in cities, fiber infrastructures in cities. And we uh, plan to implement 50-50 uh, between NATO funding and between Ukraine funds. But as, yeah, <coughs> as um, I uh, say, the, we, we uh, submit a project to our cabinet of ministry for amount uh, 50 millions of euro for establishing uh, uh, national wide infrastructure based on the dark fibers. It's about 3,000 kilometers uh, during uh, four or, or five years. And hope for the positive answer for, from, our, uh, from our authority. 
It is plans uh, for, uh, for new NATO grants. It is mainly guaranteeing uh, financing, and we hope uh, to prolong, uh, to lay uh, fibers uh, in cities uh, and connect uh, over uh, high-speed channels. Uh, you can see it is about uh, 100 kilometers inside of cities, about uh, 50 science and research institutes, and uh, the same quantity of universities. Because uh, this uh, organization connected by small uh, speed uh, lines. About connecting to the Europe, to the giant. Uh, during uh, three years, uh, we have connection uh, to the to giant uh, over uh, Telecom channels, uh, 33 megabit per second, but uh, very uh, strange, strange uh, utilization of these channels. Uh, for example, uh, one of providers, uh, uh, Center of European Integration, which uh, are connected uh, about uh, 30 universities in Ukraine, have only uh, half, uh, half megabits uh, access to, the, uh, to these channels. And uh, as a result, these channels lower that about uh, 10 10 percent, uh, and another university is connecting over uh, 100 kilobit per second. Mm, it is not clear for us, but we try to, to solve this problem and to, to clear, but it is uh, not possible, it was in the old time. Uh, just we uh, hope for another solution, and we uh, don't hope for support from our uh, telecom operator, he's uh, monopolist in Ukraine, and uh, the task, his task is another as a research education networking in Ukraine. Uh, we very appreciate to the uh, uh, to the involve us in the Porta Optica studies. It is very very. Uh, important for our uh, activities and we uh, waiting us for political result uh, and for some support in uh, networking in Ukraine. Thanks. inside this part of Europe that the main problem it is development of the infrastructure. The main entrance migrate to the direction of the dark fiber uh, infrastructure and the uh, build own equipment on this because the uh, prices in the commercial operators is not possible to support of this kind of uh, requested uh, capacity. And how European Commission could support this kind of activity in the Eastern Europe? Nice question. <coughs> Difficult to answer. Do you hear me? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's uh, at this moment in time uh, you have to uh, uh, realize that uh, we are uh, limited in the support that we can give uh, to um, uh, Eastern uh, European countries not uh, part of the European Union. Um, uh, we have specific programs for that, uh, 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 which are called international cooperation uh, uh, projects. And the Porta Optica is uh, it was a proposal in, in which is going in that direction, which might um, maybe be uh, be funded. Uh, in that, I cannot say any details on that because I do not know. Um, but. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, the initiative like uh, Porta Optica is uh, is a very good um, approach for further investigating what the opportunities are for you and uh, and and for all uh, the, uh, the 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 countries uh, um, uh, east of the uh, digital divide um, uh, line, as uh, it was so put uh, uh, um, in earlier today, um, and um, um, that. 
that the, the results from the Portica Optica, uh, Porta Optica might, might lead to, to further projects in this direction, also in the Seven Framework uh, program. Um, um, apart from that, uh, there is of course uh, the uh, regional uh, and structural uh, funding uh, opportunities, uh, but they are uh, uh, only for uh, uh, the, the, the member states. Uh, the the, the initial uh, uh, discussion for uh, for this uh, workshop was, in my view, uh, the um, the uh, Eastern European countries within the European Union, and uh, so I uh, uh, was looking uh, in this respect more towards the uh, the, the possibilities for uh, for structural funding. And if you are, you all know probably that uh, between 2007 and uh, and 2013 there will be a new uh, new. Um, uh funding opportunity there as well um, and uh, I have some figures uh, about the idea that uh, the, the the funding will be 336 billion euros of which 79 percent uh, will be for the um, uh, the poorest uh, regions in Europe uh, and uh, the, the ten mem the ten new member states uh, uh, are um, uh, probably the ones who will benefit uh, or are most likely to to benefit uh, uh, from from this uh, this uh, uh, funding uh, opportunity um, furthermore um, uh, uh, we have been discussing in the past in the previous two years uh, on what can uh, the research do uh, uh, and research program do uh, for the structural funding um, uh, or can you cope? Can we cooperate with the people in the structural uh, funding? Um, it became, or it is clear that uh, that uh, the uh, structural funding is is based on on, on national um, plans. More in particular, it is uh, the um, national uh, 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 reference uh, framework, and later on the operational programs, and. Um, the projects are are are, uh, are selected on a national uh, basis or on a, on a regional basis sometimes even, while in the research program uh, the uh, the there it are international projects, joint joint uh, projects which are uh, funded uh, uh, through an evaluation process in the in the in the in the uh, in the research program as it is. Um, over the last two years, uh, of course, knowing that uh, that it was very difficult to uh, to uh, to have a, a, a real cooperation between structural funding and uh, and, uh, and and research funding, we went, of course, uh, um, uh, no, we, we said, uh, as I can remember, to 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 the to the NRNs in several occasions that they should uh, um, uh, go towards the national government, and we did ourselves uh, the same. We went to our colleagues in the structural uh, funds and we were discussing and we are discussing with them the, the possibilities for, uh, for coordinated actions. Um, and um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit uh, happy and, uh, and also proud that, that uh, in the, in the uh, strategic community guidelines uh, for cohesion there is now explicit uh, mentioning of, uh, of um uh, the fact that um, uh, the uh, ERDF should contribute to finance RTD infrastructures, including regional high-speed data networks between and within research establishments. This is now an, uh, an opening and, uh, and an option for, for all the, uh, 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 the, the, the new member states in particular and, uh, and other poor uh, member states in Europe to, uh, to to use this to further go with in discussion with the national governments in order to uh, to uh, to to further improve uh, the situation, that is what I would like uh, to say at this moment in time. Um, unless there are more questions. It's, uh, it's not actually a question, but I would like to mention a specific support activity in the Geant 2 project, um, which uh, may target only, uh, at the moment, only a few of the countries that were presented today. Um, uh, this is a support activity which uh, includes the Terena Compendium, so which 
a survey um, request for information uh, which is annually updated. And another uh, part of this activity is uh, to support less advanced countries in the um, Giant 2 community and uh, some neighboring countries uh, in the form of um, uh, some technical workshop or managerial workshops or policy workshops whenever this is relevant. And I am the person that's leading this part of the activity. Um, so I would just, just like to uh, you know, encourage people uh, if you have uh, uh, later on, if you want, we, t we can talk about uh, what we could do. But as I said, in this activity, at the moment, there is only a, a limited set of countries that can be covered. One of the things that we would like to propose to the Commission in the next round of revision of the uh, GNT2 contract is uh, to see what possibility there is to include some other countries, specifically those that have uh, established or are establishing some agreement with the GN, uh, with GN2 uh, project. So this is all what I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm John Martin, and I, I'm based in the UK but I work on a European level. Uh, I just wanted to make some comments because it's not always obvious exactly what the basis of Géant is, and there's obviously a great deal of interest in knowing how you could become a, a part of Géant. And the first thing I'd like to point out is, if you look at countries that have been doing research networking for a long time, like the UK or like the Netherlands, you, and you count the numbers. In the UK, we're on Superjanet 4, which is actually the fifth network. It's not a very logical way of counting, but it is the fifth network. And in the Netherlands, which is more logical, it's SurfNet 5, and it's soon going to be the sixth generation. So that's the number of generations of networks that there have been at the national level. But if you look at Géant, that is the current European level. And Géant 2 is launched on... Tuesday. And the reason, the reason why Géant is so much younger than the national networks was really the difficulty of finding the right model of collaboration and cooperation and partnership for it to happen. And I have a feeling that we're probably looking in the direction of the same country, which is Austria, to find the ideas that made the type of partnership and collaboration possible. But if you look at Géant, what it is, it is a partnership, partly between the EU, which provides approximately 50% of the funding for the connections, and the NRANs of all the partner countries. That's the national networks of all the partner countries. I think there are possibly only a couple of exceptions, there's um, Nordunet, which was mentioned earlier, where the countries in question have already formed themselves into a regional network, and that partakes in Géant on behalf of those countries. And then I think very, very recently we have an example of a country that possibly has more than one NREN joining. But the, the, the general picture is that in each of the countries that takes part, there is one national research network. I mean now the organization and the people and, if you like, the recognition. So if you want to think about how you go down the road towards becoming part of Géant, one thing that is very important, and I think, can I just say, I, I thought these talks were excellent today, very, very good standard, and um, uh, quite clearly there's tremendous progress, not just towards the building of the networks, but towards the building of the organizations as well. Now, I think that the difficulties of these organizations growing is well known, and it takes a long time. And as I said, I'm from the UK, and I'm so old that I can remember when the Janet Network first started and the discussions we had at that time. I'm just going to comment about Poland. Um, I was doing a quick calculation. I was in the States. I've got my slides with me. and. My, my slides say that the United States now has something approaching 30,000 miles of dark fiber in the research and education community, which is approximately 50,000 kilometers. And my calculation is that Poland will overtake the United States sometime next year. 
So I'm slightly, slightly of the opinion that it's very fortunate that Poland gave the talk this year, because if they gave the talk next year, I don't think they could claim to be on the, um, the wrong side of the digital divide, because I think it's going <laughs> better, than, better than many of us. We would like to see the same thing happening in our own countries, let me put it that way. So that was my a comment, really, about, but it is worth looking at the importance of developing an NREN that can speak properly on behalf of the country, because that's essentially what the Géant system works as. It's a partnership between the groups of NRENs that come together, and as has been said, there's quite a few members of CNET who are members of Géant as well, and with the, the Commission. Well, you just inspired me to, to say a little bit of what we have found out in Serenata study. Uh, just uh, one or two sentences. Uh, NRENs, or newly developing NRENs, they have the great opportunity to use the fact that they have very poor infrastructure now and invest in something what we call greenfield deployments. You don't need to go all the way that we've gone through. You can use, uh, uh, say, our expertise. You can use... Uh, new technologies, you don't have to go to ATM, then to SDH, then to whatever that we've gone through. Just go for the fiber, build the fiber, connect, use cheap transmission, you can learn that from checks. Use uh, experience in connecting, managing, you can learn that from Slovaks and checks and us. And then use the good practices of Jant and connect, that's it. That's it. <laughs>